Days pour out its worst, the night calls out its name. As dawn awakes creation with a radiance, his light pours out on everything he's made. Oh, my soul, rise and sing, for you are loved by a king. Oh, my soul, praise the Lord forever. Oh, my soul, rise and sing. Pour out his words, the night calls out his name. His dawn awakes creation with the radiance, his light. Everybody, welcome to Riverhead City. My name is Lauren. I'm an here, good. and I'm really glad to see you this morning. Those of you who are joining us in person, and those of you who are joining us online um, at another time or another place, we're glad that you're here with us as well. We're going to start with a time of worship together. So why don't you stand and join me as you are able? God, thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be together as a church family and to seek after you. Hear our praise today. We were the fallen Lost in the shadows, desperate for life, but you came with mercy, not the far away kind, and called us from death.
Well, today is Palm Sunday, and as we prepare our hearts for communion, we're going to do that a little bit differently today. Um, John is going to read a gospel passage from Luke for us today about the Last Supper, and then pray for us as we get ready for communion together. bread arrived, and when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. He replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that's already set up. That's where you should prepare our meal. So they went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus has said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. But here at this table, seated among, among us as a friend, is the man who would betray me. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? So the disciples begin to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing. Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. And Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lorded over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. Would you pray with me? Loving God, uh, we're here at the table you prepared for us. Pure body and blood, we come to you as we are, nothing more and nothing less. And we offer ourselves to you in return. Come and have your way here, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There are two tables on the stage with the elements on them and one in the back by the door. And the little cups have a film with the wafer and then another film and then the juice. Um, so you're welcome to come to the Lord's table anytime in the next two songs and receive communion together.
Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, the treasures of faith are never enough. You came along and put me back to.
Yes, God, we lift up your name this morning. It's so good to worship together. You guys can have a seat, and now we have some announcements. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday to all y'all. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. We are super glad that you are here. And if you are visiting with us today, we are most especially glad that you came. We have a welcome box for you. It's available at the Welcome Center right outside these doors after the service. It has chocolate in it. Stop by, get your welcome box. Justin Law is going to be preaching today. He'd love to chat with you there as you leave. Uh, we as a church community here have a purpose that God has given to us. It is to help people love God, love people, and in doing so change the world. That's everything that we're about as a church. On Sunday we have a chance to give toward that purpose and I would like to pray into that. Uh, God, we're so grateful that you have been so generous to us. You've given us yourself, you've given us your son, you've given us a family, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and you've given us everything we have. And as we give back, God, it's our hope um, that you would do a miracle, that you would turn money into people who love you and people who love each other here and outside our walls and all around the world. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Could you please take the connection card out of your program? We ask everyone who comes, would you please fill one of these out each week that you are here? If you're with us regularly, you can just put your name on the front. If you're visiting, give us as much information as you're comfortable. And there's stuff going on at River Heights that you can interact with on your card. We like to highlight the spot for prayer requests. Each week, those of us on staff are praying for every request we receive. We want you to know there are people in your church praying for you. And so let us know how to pray. At the end of the service, these go in the connection card boxes, which are on the walls at the ends of the aisle and by the door on your way out. Uh, we are in Easter week, Holy Week. That's the season where we reflect on Christ's journey to the cross and then celebrate Christ's resurrection. And so we have some invitations for you this week. First off, on Friday the 15th from 4 to 8, we're going to have our Stations of the Cross experience here at River Heights. And that's an experience where you go through 14 things that happened to Jesus on his way to the cross in an experiential and reflective way. I've seen so many people go through this experience and come out crying or having had a vision of Christ or some encounter with God that really moved them. And so we have a ton of people who like to sign up for this experience. And so we're asking you to sign up. The way you do that is to go to the River Heights Vineyard website, click on events, and then sign up for Stations of the Cross. If you don't know how to do that, ask a young person near you, and they will help you. It's okay to not know how to use the internet. You'll be fine. And um, I just want to encourage you, make the time and come meet God and see what happens. And then, of course, on Easter Sunday, we're going to have our Easter services. We're going to start off with a 6.15 a.m., sorry, second service people, sunrise service, which you are totally welcome to come to. We have a cooking team of 20 people who's going to be making uh, deep fried donuts. We'll decorate them and we'll do, I haven't decided yet. We might do chicken and waffles. We might do shrimp and grits. We'll see. We're going to make some good breakfast. Breakfast will be served after sunrise service. There's usually some leftovers after first service. We're going to have our two regular services at 8.45 and 10.30 a.m. I hope to see you there. Easter is the greatest Sunday in the church calendar. It's the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And so I look forward to seeing you next week. We have two more things coming up. First off, we're having a bilingual worship night. All the vineyard churches and La Vinas, that's the Spanish-speaking churches, like our very own church, um, La Vina Inver, uh, that's meeting right now. We're going to get together. We're going to have a worship jam night. It's going to be on the 23rd, Friday, at 7 p.m. We're going to have Justin Law leading an all-star worship team of folks. And then we're going to have a half hour of time just to connect and hang out with each other. I'm going to preach a short message, and then we're going to go to Applebee's together. It's going to be great. I hope that you can come. Lastly, our regional women's conference, which is called Engaging in the Kingdom, is coming up May 5th through 7th in Duluth. I've never been. But the word of mouth is really fantastic about this conference. And so it's an opportunity to engage in community building, build friendships and relationships with other women. There's a Thursday evening session for leaders and then main sessions all Friday and Saturday until noon. For more information, you go to the Duluth Vineyard website, duluthvineyard.org, and look for Engaging in the Kingdom. All right, please take a moment, say hi to somebody nearby. Justin Law is going to come deliver a really great message forthwith.
Wow, hey, good morning. So good to see you all, and it's nice to hear you all greeting each other. And uh, it doesn't bother me to have that going on when I'm, when I'm starting. It's a, yeah, it's a fantastic thing, and greetings to you if you're joining us from home. My name is Justin, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just really glad to be sharing the message today. As some of you are aware and you've heard this morning, this week is called Holy Week. It uh, ends next week with the celebration of Easter Sunday, and it begins with this Sunday, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday remembers the day of Jesus' triumphal or triumphant entry into Jerusalem. It depends on which uh, translation of the Bible you're using as far as the word that they use. But uh, the people were very excited that day when Jesus came to the capital city. They think this is when Jesus is going to make his move. They expect that he's going to do something along the lines of maybe rile up the people for a riot, maybe overthrow the hated Roman government, maybe take religious power from the leaders who oppose him. Any of those things, maybe all of those things. And Jesus is going to make his move. But it's not going to be how anyone except Jesus expects it to be. And we'll see in our Bible passage from the Gospel of Luke today, the people call Jesus their king. They believe he's going to make himself king. In a different way, the truth is deeper, though. Jesus already is king. Let's read about it in Luke 19, 35 through 40. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along. Praise God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Okay? Jesus had done so many awesome things that they were just recounting all the things that they had seen him do. The people were rolling out in their own way, rolling out the red carpet for Jesus as he, as he came into town. The same day is recounted in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's in chapter 21. And so this was obviously a really memorable day. This was a big deal. Matthew gives us some extra bits of information. Like, people were already, um, were not only using their garments in front of Jesus, they were cutting branches off of palm trees and laying them down on the road before Jesus. And that's where this Sunday gets its name, Palm Sunday. And this is what the people were shouting. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. So Jesus was not disagreeing with anything that is being said about him or done. He is the king, and he is worthy of glory. Matthew 21.10 tells us, The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. Whether we've had a relationship with Jesus for years or a short time or haven't begun a relationship with him at all yet, that's a question we all need to answer. Who is this Jesus? What kind of king is he? And is he a king worth following? And so today, we're going to see that Jesus' kingdom coming does not look like an earthly kingdom coming. Jesus defies people's expectations during Holy Week, and he still defies our expectations sometimes today. And that's a good thing. And so I'm just going to pray and invite Jesus to maybe surprise us with some good stuff today. Would you just join your hearts with mine? Jesus, we thank you for your love for us. We acknowledge you as the risen king. And we welcome you to surprise us again today with your goodness. We welcome you, Lord. Amen. Thanks for praying with me. A few years ago, I was asked to travel to the Vineyard Worship Leaders Retreat for the Southeast region, and it was in the mountains of North Carolina at a retreat center founded by evangelist Billy Graham. It was very nice. It was four days of worship, teaching, friendship, ministering to each other. It was really great. Um, and 
I actually think it's one of the greatest things that happens in the entire vineyard movement. And so if you're not a worship leader or worship person, I'm sorry that you cannot go. It's kind of like the women's retreats being awesome and I can't go. So there's something, there's something great for us, you know, whatever, whatever we need, God gets to us. But during that week, I got to be interviewed this, for, uh, for the, uh, the Ferment podcast by my friend Adam, who is a great, great interviewer. And um, strangely enough, it just so happens two weeks ago, I made a second appearance on that. So if you're not sick of me today, you could go find the Ferment podcast wherever you, wherever you find your podcast. You could listen to what I have to say in my conversation with Adam. Um, the real reason that I'm, I'm making this point about North Carolina is that something else happened that was special while I was there. I met a new friend. His name is Andy Squires. And Andy is a worship pastor at Queen City Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he happens to have written the song Cherry Blossoms, which we do in worship together um, pretty regularly here at RHV. And Andy is also a really gifted singer-songwriter. He's super poetic. He's amazing at putting the beauty and the questions and the struggles and the doubts of his faith into his songs. And he's passionate in person, too. During the retreat, a number of us would gather in someone's room and we'd stay up late discussing faith, we would be joking around, we would argue about stuff, and sometimes someone would share something that was really deeply personal and we'd cry together. The Billy Graham people might not be super thrilled to know that somebody snuck a bottle of whiskey into the room for us to share, um, but we don't have to tell them that. Um, Andy recently posted something online that was really moving to me. And it's in line with today's topic. And I asked him whether I could share part of it. And he said, absolutely, by text. And then he sent me a little heart. So I think we're good. It's called Damn That Curated Life. I'll read it to you. Man cave, why would I build an effigy of my own inner isolation? I'm lonely enough in my mind already. Damn that curated life. Damn all the energy we put into searching for self-gratification. Happy are those who are depleted, who do not exalt themselves. Self-care is important, but self-sacrifice even more so. Drink wine and watch Netflix if you must, but drink a suffering cup too. In any attempt to pursue your dreams, make sure you're not just constructing a graven image of yourself to yourself. Many saints have lived in the abundance of Christ, completely unknown and with not a nickel to spare. The good life is hidden and small, marked by restraint and patience, unenvious of practical, practically everything. That's a lot of poetry and passion. Here's one of the things that I think he's saying. Now, we don't tend to should people here at River Heights very often. You ever notice that? You don't hear the word should very often. We invite people, and we expect that God can help us figure out what he has for us. Uh, but later on, I'm actually going to let Andy should us a little bit, okay? I think that's okay, because the world around us is already shooting us a lot. Have you noticed that you've been being shooted a lot? In this world, we're often told that what the good life is looks a certain way. We're repeatedly given the message that the most public people are the most important people. We were repeatedly encouraged to spend most of our time following our stuff, our dreams, our purposes, ourselves. And other things can get crowded out if we do that. Our public lives can crowd out our integrity in our private lives? Have we seen that happening around us? Our drive for stuff can crowd out generosity. Our personal dreams and plans can crowd out God's dreams and plans for our lives whenever they're different. Our selfish purposes can crowd out God's higher purposes for our lives. That crowding out can make it harder to do the purpose that God has for us as a church body, and you heard what that is. In the announcements, it's to help a growing number of people love God, love people, and in doing so, change the world. It's a great purpose, and it's not a self, 
focus purpose, is it? Andy Squires is saying that following Jesus pushes back against selfishness by including service, the secret stuff, and sacrifice. There are so many people here in this RHV family who have embraced service and sacrifice, and I am so grateful for all of you. You inspire me, and I hope we take turns inspiring each other. That's what's supposed to be happening around here, and it does. I was thinking about my life uh, this last week. I figured if I was going to preach on this stuff, I should think about myself. That's fair, right? Where am I tempted to lead that damn curated life that Andy is talking about? And one area um, I have noticed over time that's been a struggle sometimes, at least, in my creative life uh, is the music that I get to make. So, you know, God has given me some skills and talents to make music, and those are gifts from God. And I've tried to be faithful. I've tried to work at developing them, uh, you know, getting better with what God has given me. But at times... I've treated those gifts like they're mine, just to use however I want, to use them for myself. And at times, I haven't asked God what he might want me to do with them. At times, I've assumed things, just like the people in Jerusalem did on Palm Sunday. God has allowed me lots of opportunities to write music out of my relationship with him, and some of it has been usable and, uh, you know, appears in our Sunday morning times together, and that's just awesome. How cool, what an honor, and a humbling thing. But at times, I've hoped that, the, that I'd have the world's picture of success, that people would be impressed when they hear the song, um, maybe that I would become more public. Now, I'm more aware of myself today than I was earlier in my life. And if I had been more aware and had been honest enough earlier in my life to say it, when I closed my eyes and when I dreamed, my dream would have been backwards sometimes. Instead of picturing a triumphant Jesus coming into town with me following, when I closed my eyes and pictured my dream, sometimes I'm sure I would have pictured a triumphant me coming into town with Jesus with me. It sounds totally ridiculous to say, but I think we do get it backwards a lot of the time. And this is what I think that Andy meant when he said we can be constructing a graven image of ourselves for ourselves. Now, thank Jesus, he forgives us, and he includes us before we're perfect. So I'm a work in progress. You probably are too. But Jesus has freed me and has been freeing me, and I've been changed. I've grown out of selfishness over time. And I hope the people who make music with me today would say the same thing. You could check with them. If you uh, hear anything different, let me know. <laughs> but how about you? Have you ever gotten it backwards? Putting your grand plans first and then trying to make Jesus your sidekick or the one who is following you? That can happen maybe in your work life, in your family life, in your creative life, in your church life. Oh, no. Possible. If so, you are in good company. And I don't mean just my company. I would hope my company is good, but that's not what I mean. I mean in good company with the people in uh, the first Palm Sunday and even Jesus' first disciples. Those people in the crowd on that first Palm Sunday, they called Jesus king and they whooped it up. They wanted God. They wanted God's promises. They wanted freedom. They were sincere. They also had some very definite ideas about Jesus would, what Jesus would and should do. And when Jesus does something different than that, they get confused, they get disappointed, they get angry. And before Holy Week is done, the, these same people in these crowds that are shouting, Hosanna and calling Jesus king, will have given up on him. They will be chanting to crucify Jesus by Friday. Jesus' disciples had expectations, too. James and John wanted to sit next to Jesus when he took his throne, and they would have expected that throne to be an earthly one somewhere in Jerusalem. 
And like we read in our, like, in, like we heard in our communion reading this morning, even when Jesus is talking about his body broken and his blood shed for him, uh, shed for his disciples, they're actually arguing about which one of them is going to be the greatest. They don't get it yet, and Jesus tells them that the greatest in his kingdom serves and sacrifices. In Mark chapter 8, the disciple Peter is a great example of getting confused and upset when Jesus starts going in an unexpected direction. Mark 8, 31 starts this way. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples... Did you ever wonder whether Jesus talked openly about this? He did, right here. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. I'm not your sidekick, Peter. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. A Bible commentary I read describes it like this. It says, Peter is understandably alarmed at what Jesus has said. It's an alarming thing to say, isn't it? And then he begins to rebuke him. Peter has just confessed Jesus as the Christ, the royal Messiah, and that happened right before this happened. So he just totally sticks the landing, and then he totally blows it right after that, okay? The prediction that Jesus makes uh, makes no sense to Peter. The words of Peter are sincere and hopeful, but misguided. Have you ever been like Peter? Sincere and hopeful, but misguided. Have you ever told Jesus, no, hold on, Jesus, I know we're trying to win here, And if we're going to win, we need to do it my way. I have thought about this. (laughs) Have you ever been like me? Jesus does things differently because he is a different kind of king. And our Old Testament reading uh, describes the kind of king that he is. And we're going to look at it in Isaiah 50. All the Old Testament promises and descriptions of the Messiah point directly to Jesus. And this passage is an excellent example. Now, keep in mind that this is written about 700 years before Jesus, but it's like it could come directly out of Jesus' mouth. Isaiah 50, 4 through 9. The sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom so that I know how to comfort the weary. Morning by morning, he wakens me and opens my understanding to his will. The sovereign Lord has spoken to me, and I have listened. I have not rebelled or turned away. This describes the kind of king that Jesus is. He is wise with words from God the Father. Is anyone here needing God's wisdom? Jesus has it for you. Jesus comforts the weary and the needy. Is there anyone needing comfort in the room today. Jesus has it for you. Jesus understands God's will. Anyone need to know God's will for your life? Jesus can help you. Jesus listens when God speaks. Does anyone else need help listening for God? Jesus can help you. And Jesus does not turn away from doing the Father's will. Does anyone need help not turning away when things get really hard and you get confused? Jesus can help you. Now, the next section of Isaiah 50 is also really specific and descriptive of what Jesus is going to go through, specifically in Holy Week as he goes towards the cross. And so I'm going to read that. It starts in 7. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a stone, determined to do his will. 
and I know that I will not be put to shame. He who gives me justice is near. Who will dare to bring charges against me? Where are my accusers? Let them appear. See, the sovereign Lord is on my side. Who will declare me guilty? Now, there's a surprising difference between this part of the psalm and what actually happens to Jesus as he goes to the cross. I don't know if you noticed that, if you know the story of how this goes. Jesus is helped by the Lord, like the psalm says, but to all human eyes, he will soon be disgraced on the cross. Jesus is determined to do the will of the Father, like the psalm says, but to all the human eyes, he will soon be put to shame. The God of justice was near Jesus his whole life, but Jesus wasn't given justice, and he did not feel the nearness of God while he was on the cross. Jesus wasn't guilty, but accusers came and brought false charges against him. Where are his accusers? All around him. The sovereign Lord was on his side, but Jesus was declared guilty and he was sentenced to death. So why the difference? I think it's because Jesus is even better than advertised in the Old Testament. It turns out that when God comes to us in Christ, God is more loving than anyone in the Old Testament could have guessed. He's better than anyone could have imagined. In Holy Week, it's Jesus, God himself, serving us and sacrificing himself for us. Not because he had to, but because the Father wanted him to, and that was the plan, and he wanted to. It says that Jesus had joy set before him, and that's why he was able to do what he did. He wanted to do it. Jesus wanted to die for you. In our Bible reading plan, the scripture we just read, where we stopped, it actually stops halfway through the last verse, and I just thought that that was kind of strange. And so I'm actually wondering if it was left out of the reading plan because it doesn't sound very encouraging. Can I read it to you anyway? It ends, this is 9b. All my enemies will be destroyed like claws that have been eaten by moths. Now, I'm including it because I'm pretty sure Isaiah expected the Messiah King to destroy all of his enemies. I think a lot of us have hoped that God would just take care of everything and destroy all his enemies, sometimes. But if God did that, I have been an enemy of God, and I would have been destroyed. And in the Bible, it says that we've all been enemies of God. So maybe, pretty good deal that God doesn't want to destroy his enemies at all. Instead, he wants to die for them, he wants to make them his friends, and he wants to save them. Romans 5, 10 and 11 says, For since our friendship was with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God made us friends of God. And so on Easter Sunday, we will celebrate that even though Jesus was killed on Good Friday, he rose from the dead and is alive on Easter Sunday. So who is Jesus? He's the kind of king who serves you and sacrifices for you because he wants to be your friend and he wants to save you. He's the servant king and he's alive today right now, present to us right now. And he still is wise. He comforts the weary and the needy right now. He understands God's will. He listens when God speaks. He does the Father's will without turning away. And he's still turning the enemies of God into friends of God. In our Mark 8 passage today, Jesus said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Today and every day, Jesus invites you to leave your own way and to follow him. And with the help of God, you can leave your own way. 
you can pick up your cross and you can follow him. And in following him, you can become wise like the servant king. You can comfort the weary and the needy like the, like the servant king. You can understand God's will like the servant king. You can listen when God speaks just like the servant king. And you can do the Father's will without turning away like the servant king. And one of the best things that you can do is you can be part of the servant king turning enemies of God into friends of God. It's so cool. Andy Squires ended his thoughts on the curated life like this. You've been invited by God to give what you have to others. You've been asked to follow Christ into the sweet blessedness of deprivation. Don't dream of being famous and important dream of being satisfied with being known among a precious few. We see religious empires crumbling before our very eyes, but do not be afraid. Empires come and go. What should we do when the wicked prosper? And here's where he's going to show us a little bit, okay? You ready for Andy, Andy Squire shooting us? We should rejoice in God's faithfulness. We should pray for the persecutors. We should welcome the gift of a small hidden life. We should embrace the hope that the kingdom of God is already present in all the world. I think that that's some really great shooting. Thank you, Andy. The kingdom of God is present in all the world right now. There's a king who serves and sacrifices for us because he wants to be friends with us. He invites us to give up our own way and follow him. He's the servant king, and he is worth following. Is he not? Now, one place that we experience the coming of God's kingdom is here, when we gather together here and worship and pray. And so we're going to end our service the way that we normally do, with an opportunity to respond to God in worship and in prayer. And so I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able with me. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. And prayer team people, we've got trained prayer people. If you would be so kind as to make yourself available to pray for people, that would be awesome because I think that God wants to do some things to bless some people today. And it's easier if we have people to actually pray for that. I'll start staring people down if I need to, but <laughs> I think you'll get it figured out. I'm going to leave you with three tips to take into your week. The first is to read Isaiah 50, 4 through 9a. And then if you want to, do 9b and realize that, hey, God didn't want to destroy everybody. God wants to be friends. And then pray. Ask God to help you understand, listen, and not turn away the things that the servant king does. Ask God to help you do those things. The Holy Spirit is present to you to help you do that. One of the special places that the Holy Spirit can meet you is here in receiving prayer. So if you need encouragement, do that. Um, but also know that as you accept Christ and receive his spirit, the spirit of God will go with you and be with you and will be in you wherever you are and can help you. And then the do is pick up your cross and follow the servant king Jesus. Now, I do not know what that is for you, but here are some hints. It likely requires some trust, some courage, and some service and sacrifice. Pick up your cross and follow King Jesus. The Holy Spirit is here to help you do that. He wants to help you do that for the rest of your life. I also want to point out that we have that once-a-year opportunity to follow along with Jesus in a very special way uh, on his way to the cross that first Good Friday, and it's this Friday, Good Friday. Um, Stations of the Cross. You might just want to sign up for that. I can almost guarantee you that Jesus will speak something to you or show you something about what it means for you to follow him right now, wherever you're at in your life. And next Sunday, I hope to see you here for Easter. Come to the sunrise service. Come to one of the other two services. Come to them all. Bring a friend, and it's going to be wonderful. 
So let's worship together. Come up and get prayer. The Spirit of the Lord is here. And the worship team will lead us and let us know when it's time to go. Blessings on you, friends, in the mighty name of Jesus. Comfort me, be my peace in your compassion. Would you carry me, Lord? These days can be so cruel, but I'm not forsaken. For your love is true. In your presence I will find my joy. With a thankful heart I will lift my voice. On the mountain top. In the valley low, I will praise you, God. You are my home. Take these eyes, let them see. Oh, help me. Take these eyes, let them see, oh, help me remember what you've done for me. In your presence, I will find my joy with the We were the fallen, the runaway kind, lost in the shadows, 
desperate for life but you came with mercy not the far away kind and called us from death to join you in life now we are the sense of the Holy Spirit's presence with us this morning. And I know that uh, God has good things for you. Even today, even right now while we're here. If that feels challenging for you, I encourage you to come forward and get prayer. 
sometimes it's hard to square uh, our knowledge that God has good things for us and how things actually feel right now in our lives. And prayer, uh, prayer is a good way to make that connection, right? Or ask for help. So if there's something that God's talking to you about right now, something that's on your heart, come forward and get prayer. One of these folks would be happy to pray good things for you. They're trained to do so very well. We're going to continue to worship together a bit. Feel free to stay and, and worship with us. If you need to go, you're dismissed. Go with God. He loves you. Amen. Sing his glory, the skies call out.